Right. Uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the launch of Professor Ambul's book, um, Economic Change in Modern Indonesia, Colonial and Postcolonial Comparisons. Uh, my name is Satoshi Miyamura uh, at the Economics Department here at SOAS, and I'm, it's my honor to welcome back uh, Professor Anne Booth, who is our uh, emeritus, yes, <laughs> professor, never really have left us. Um, so just briefly, Professor Anne Booth have uh, worked in various universities in Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Australia, before joining SOAS in 1991. Uh, she has been the leading academic in the research in the modern economic history of Southeast Asia, with particular focus on the legacies of various colonial powers in the region and their impact on post-colonial development. Uh, her recent work includes a comparative study of European and Japanese colonial legacies in Asia and a study of trade and investment links between China and Southeast Asia. So tonight, Professor Booth will speak for about 20 minutes um, about her new book, um, and that will uh, leave us enough time to have a useful uh, Q&A uh, discussion. So I'd like to hand over to Professor Booth uh, for her presentation. Thanks very much, Satoshi, and thank you all for coming. Um, there are still some flyers here. Uh, please take one, or in fact take more than one if you have uh, friends with an interest in Indonesia who uh, aren't able to come. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the book, really, what it's about, why I wrote it. Uh, but as Satoshi said, I hope we've got some time at the end for some questions and answers, because I know uh, several of you who are from Indonesia or have lived in Indonesia have a strong interest in the country. Uh, these days I know many uh, people working on Indonesia, indeed Southeast Asia, certainly in this country, tend to feel, well, we're a bit marginalized. Everybody's so interested in China. Uh, but I think uh, the balance is perhaps changing a little bit, uh, and certainly I think uh, Indonesia is clearly an important country for a number of reasons, not least its size, uh, and its role uh, in the ASEAN uh, community. Uh, but it's still not very well understood. Uh, so what I do in the book to begin with is really talk about what I call Indonesia's three great watersheds in the latter part of the 20th century. The first, of course, was the transfer of power in 1949. Now, of course, all Indonesians learn at school and uh, many foreigners studying Indonesian uh, history learn that uh, Sukarno and Hatta uh, declared independence uh, on the 17th of August, 1945, and this is celebrated, of course, as Indonesia's National Day, two days after the Japanese surrender, a time of uh, considerable confusion Indeed, I think the evidence suggests Sukarno and Hatta were rather pushed into this declaration uh, by some of the younger, the Pemuda, the younger, the more aggressive nationalists who saw this as an opportunity, finally, uh, for Indonesia to assert, assert its independence. But the colonial power uh, did not recognize that declaration. And there was four years of really quite bitter struggle uh, between the Dutch, who were, of course, determined uh, to keep their huge Southeast Asian colony, by far the most important colony that the Dutch possessed. Um, why were the Dutch so intransigent? Of course, it's worth remembering 1946, the Americans had uh, 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 passed, uh, uh, given the Philippines uh, full independence. 1947, of course, saw full independence being given uh, to the British uh, possessions in South Asia. Why were the Dutch so intransigent? Well, I think the real reason was, of course, economic. Uh, and during the war, some of you might have heard of uh, what's become known as the Dirksen-Tinbergen Memorandum. Tinbergen, of course, a very well-known Dutch economist. Uh, this was uh, drawn up in the Netherlands, then, of course, occupied by the Germans, it really was a rather crude attempt, and as it turned out, a quite inaccurate attempt, to estimate the loss to the Netherlands from Indonesian independence. And Dirksen and Tinberg, and indeed many other Dutch, came to the conclusion that the loss of the Indies would be devastating for the Dutch economy, already, of course, severely weakened uh, by the German occupation and so on. 
Uh, so I think really the reason the Dutch were so determined to keep their colony was economic. Um, of course, many of you will know uh, there was a long period of negotiations. To begin with, the Americans uh, were rather suspicious of the Indonesian nationalists. The Dutch, of course, thought Sukarno and Hatta were little more than Japanese collaborators. Uh, but gradually, the Americans were won around. Also, the Australians uh, came to the conclusion uh, that these were nationalists, but they were not communists, uh, and therefore... Uh, the major Western powers should acknowledge uh, the independence of Indonesia. And finally, uh, the Dutch were forced into uh, conceding uh, sovereignty. So that was the first watershed. The second, of course, was in 1965-66. There was an attempted coup which resulted uh, the death of six generals. Uh, this triggered a violent backlash against the, particularly the Indonesian Communist Party. Uh, and in March 1966, Suharto and his allies in the military wrested power from Sukarno, of course, the first president. This whole era is still surrounded uh, by a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, and um, Certainly, it's still pretty unclear what motivated the coup, who was really behind it. Uh, but quite obviously, uh, it was an opportunity finally for the army uh, to wrest power from uh, Sukarno and also, of course, to destroy the Communist Party. March 66, of course, is the famous date when the so-called Super Samar was signed, which basically meant Sukarno surrendered his power. Now, Suharto at the time was not a very particularly well-known uh, general, even within Indonesia, let alone internationally. Uh, and to begin with, I think he was seen as a rather weak transitional figure. Uh, but of course, that turned out to be not the case. He was, in fact, in power for 32 years. Finally, he was forced to resign in May 1988 after a catastrophic economic collapse which in turn triggered uh, massive riots, particularly in some of the larger towns across Java. Um, so, uh, Sahato resigned, and quite constitutionally, he resigned in favor of his uh, vice president, Dr. Habibi, the German-trained aeronautics engineer who became president. Uh, but Habibi's power, uh, term in power was short, and then two further presidents succeeded uh, in fairly quick succession for constitutional amendments led, of course, to the first direct presidential elections in 2004, uh, which led to the uh, election of Cecilio Bambang Diono, who served for 10 years. So these are the three watersheds that really the book works around. Uh, but I do spend a bit of time looking at the colonial legacies. As I said, the Dutch were convinced that the loss of the Indies uh, would mean economic devastation for the Netherlands. And indeed, you can see really why they thought that. It was well known uh, that, uh, that the Netherlands economy had received large remittances through the 19th and into the 20th century uh, from Indonesia, first of all through the so-called culture system. Uh, at one point in the 1850s, I think a substantial part of the Dutch budget was in fact being funded by remittances uh, from the Indies. And then even when the so-called culture cell cell was brought to an end, uh, with substantial remittances on private account from the state companies and, of course, from uh, oil and mining companies. Uh, and these did have uh, an important impact on the Dutch economy. Um, what did the Dutch leave behind? Well, the educational legacy was very meager, and certainly if we compare with what the Americans did in the Philippines. There was very limited access to secondary and tertiary education, even in comparison with other uh, colonies in Asia. Infrastructure was developed, particularly in Java. In fact, Java had a fairly good endowment of roads, railways, irrigation, compared with really just about anywhere else in the region except possibly Taiwan. Uh, but of course, outside Java, things were very different. In those parts of Sumatra, Kalimantan, where there were states or large mines, infrastructure was built. Uh, but elsewhere, particularly in eastern Indonesia, it was neglected. Living standards were low, and again, probably lower than other parts of colonial Southeast Asia. 
I argue they were certainly lower than the Philippines, probably British Malaya, and indeed Thailand, which of course had managed to escape direct colonial control. Now, many of you will know, of course, that the early 20th century, the Dutch actually did become rather concerned about what they saw as the problem of poverty or declining welfare, particularly in Java. That led to a set of policies which became known as the ethical policy. More emphasis certainly on agricultural development and of course on moving Java's surplus population to other parts of the country, either as wage workers or indeed as agricultural settlers. Uh, there was also some modest improvement in education, particularly at the primary level. Uh, now, these policies, uh, I think, did influence, uh, particularly the Suharto government. I might come back to that. My argument in the book is that um, the ethical policy did have quite long, did have quite uh, significant impact on post-colonial developments, and particularly uh, during the period when Suharto was in power and when the economy was uh, doing well mainly as a result of increased oil revenues. But to, very, to look very quickly, first of all, at the post-1949 period, um, the book has a chapter looking at really the period from 49, the transfer of power, through to 65 or 66, uh, the end of the Sukarno period. As I said, negotiations of, with the Dutch were very difficult. Finally, a financial and economic agreement was signed in 1949, it's usually called the FINEC. That left the Dutch with considerable control over the economy. In fact, many nationalists were quite bitter and blamed Sukarno and Hatta in particular uh, for really conceding too much to the Dutch. They said, well, we might have got political independence, but the Dutch still have substantial control over the economy, of course, they still had significant interests. They owned large estates, they owned banks, they owned trading houses, they owned manufacturing industry. Uh, and really, the Phoenix did more or less uh, leave all these assets in the hands of the Dutch. That inevitably caused resentment. Uh, you had the growth, I talk about this in the book, but through the 1950s, the growth of economic nationalism. People who really wanted more aggressive policies, not just against the Dutch, but also, of course, against the Chinese. Now, the Chinese were a small minority, certainly compared with British Malaya. They were a much smaller minority in Indonesia, only about 2% of the population. But they did disproportionately control those parts of the economy that weren't in Dutch or indeed foreign hands. Uh, and that also began to cause resentment, particularly in the middle part of the 1950s. Uh, Herbert Feith, the Australian political scientist who wrote a classic book called The uh, Decline of Constitutional Democracy in Indonesia, which looks at the 1950s, he made this distinction between the administrators and what he termed the solidarity makers, who were really the economic nationalists. The administrators were the people like, for example, Sumitro Dyoyo Hadikusumo, uh, the father of the rather controversial uh, uh, general who contested the last election unsuccessfully. Sumitro was, of course, a, uh, a Dutch-trained economist. Um, he and Shafruk and Pralgir Nagara, who was a, um, da he was a lawyer, uh, they took over key economic posts in the early cabinets. Uh, I think one was the Minister of uh, Finance, the other was the Minister of Trade. They were both moderate nationalists, and they both, I think, realized that Indonesia would need to continue, although they were unhappy with aspects of the FINEC, uh, they did realize Indonesia would need foreign investment um, and couldn't abruptly nationalize uh, all the foreign-owned um, uh, enterprises in Indonesia. But they largely lost power by 1957. And of course, finally 1959, Sakano signed the decree adopting the 1945 constitution uh, which gave the president considerably more executive powers. At the same time, there were aggressive policies to nationalize virtually all the Dutch-owned assets in Indonesia. Uh, and of course, many Dutch nationals at that point had to leave. Um, I look in the book at the period from 1959 through to 66. This is often seen, I think correctly, as a period of considerable economic decline, mounting inflation, almost certainly growing poverty. Sukarno himself, a very flamboyant nationalist, uh, liked to talk about what he called Indonesian socialism, 
Uh, but in fact, much of this period did see, well, I argue that there was a weakening of central government control, particularly over those parts of the Outer Islands uh, that produced the exports. Indeed, another well-known Australian uh, political economist who's worked on Indonesia for many years, uh, the late Jamie Mackey, he talked about de facto federalism. He said, really, through the early and mid-1960s, many of the export-producing regions virtually seceded, uh, and they just uh, conducted their own trade, particularly, of course, with neighboring Malaysia. Um, we should bear in mind that per capita GDP was still well below uh, 1940, the 1940 level in the late 1950s, uh, and there was very little growth at all between the late 50s and the late 60s. There were some improvements, particularly in access to education, uh, but growing resentment, as I said, outside Java at the failure of the government in Jakarta to give export-producing provinces what they saw as a fair share of their revenues. These feelings were particularly strong in Sumatra. And indeed, uh, some uh, politicians and military people outside Java were starting to say, well, you know, the Javanese have just replaced the Dutch, but their policies are equally exploitative. And this resentment boiled over into rebellions in the late 50s. Most of these rebels did not want to secede. They didn't want Indonesia to break up, but they wanted a federal state, or at least a much more decentralized system which gave the uh, resource-rich regions outside Java more power uh, over their resources and certainly over their exports. At the same time, you had um, a, a sort of new class of um, political, no, not political, really government officials, but often government officials working with key politicians they became more powerful. Uh, you may know the well-known book by the Dutch scholar Wertheim, Indonesia Society in Transition, that came out in the mid-1950s. Uh, and he argued that, in fact, even during the colonial period, a small but significant number of Indonesians had been given jobs in the civil service uh, and, to a lesser extent, in the state enterprises, the railways, for example. Um, and they'd been moved up into more responsible jobs during the Japanese period. Uh, and they, of course, took over most of the senior government jobs after 1949. Uh, at the same time, you had large firms in the private sector, as I said, mainly Chinese. Ironically, the Chinese probably benefited from the nationalization of Dutch profit, uh, property. Uh, many Chinese business people bought up Dutch enterprises when the Dutch were forced to leave when they were expelled in the late 50s. Well, as I said, the early 60s was a period of economic dislocation, almost certainly living standards fell, um, and uh, there was mounting inflation. Sukarno himself, and I think most of his key ministers, were really pretty much in denial. I mean, uh, a well-known biography of Sukarno, again by an Australian historian, John Legg, argues, I think correctly, that Sukarno himself was never much interested in economics and didn't really think it was terribly important. Uh, he was a flamboyant nationalist. He thought the Indonesian masses would follow him simply, of course, because uh, he was the charismatic national leader. Well, there was some truth in that, but at the same time, by the mid-1960s, people realized, or many people realized, their living standards were falling. Uh, and uh, that there would have to be some kind of change. And well, as I said, the change came dramatically and uh, pretty, in a pretty bloody way, really, in 1955-56. Sorry, 1965-66. Well, Suharto and his military associates knew that foreign assistance would be essential to rehabilitate infrastructure. They were very aware of the fact that per capita GDP in Indonesia at that time, mid-1960s, was probably lower than it had been uh, in the late Dutch period. Um, they gave top priority to economic growth because they thought this was the only way to improve living standards, but of course they realized that they would need, certainly Sahato and his military associates realized that he would need Western-trained economists uh, to negotiate, particularly with the donors. The World Bank, of course, came back to Indonesia, uh, and of course the foreign investors. 
Uh, and that, at that point, you had this famous group of economists based at the University of Indonesia that were known as the Berkeley Mafia. Most of them had been trained in America, uh, several at the University of California at Berkeley, which is how that name, uh, how they earned that name. Uh, the key person was Wijoyo Miki Sastro, uh, an extremely competent uh, economist, but also as he turned into a very highly skilled politician. And he was able to deal uh, both with Sahato and the military on the one hand, uh, and with the foreigners, including, of course, powerful institutions like the World Bank, who, of course, were telling Indonesia in no uncertain terms what had to be done. And Wajoro is the one who could say, well, look, we realize that policies X, Y, and Z have to be implemented, uh, but it will take time. Uh, I think it's very important. I mean, these days I know uh, you hear foreigners and indeed some Indonesians saying that, oh, the Berkeley Mafia were you know, exponents of neoliberalism. That actually was not a term that was much in use in the late 1960s. My own view, and I argue this in the book, is that they were really cautious pragmatists who were very well aware of Indonesia's problems and also aware of the problems of implementing changes in policy, not just uh, Wajoyo himself, but others like Mohamed Sadli, who was a key person in drawing up the new foreign investment law, which was uh, implemented in 1967. Sadli knew very well foreign investment was still deeply unpopular uh, with many sections of Indonesian public opinion. Uh, so they knew we, you know, Sadli would tell uh, his Western friends, of whom he had a large number, uh, we have to proceed cautiously, we have to proceed slowly. I know you're telling us to make all these reforms as quickly as possible, uh, but we can't do it quickly because uh, we've got some very powerful groups uh, who are basically opposed to us, and that indeed was true. In a way, the immediate tasks were actually to bring down inflation and bring order to the public finances, and also to pr provide proper incentives to export producers so they could use legitimate methods of getting their products through the ports, in other words, eliminate the smuggling. And in all this, they were actually surprisingly successful. Even today, that experience in Indonesia between 1966 and 1969 is often used almost as a textbook case of how you can turn around an economy that was in pretty dreadful shape fairly quickly by implementing um, what the World Bank would call uh, not exactly neoliberal, but certainly market-based uh, policies, and particularly, of course, with the exchange rate. While Sahato immediately ran into problems, the early years of the new order, he did face opposition from student groups, from parts of the military, some in the business community. These days, I often hear Sahato referred to as a dictator. Well, he certainly wasn't a dictator over that period. Uh, he was actually having to negotiate every step of the way not just with colleagues in the military, but also with other groups. There's particular anger about the emphasis on attracting foreign investment. Many Indonesians thought this was, in a sense, a retrograde step. It was going back to the colonial period, particularly, not surprisingly, perhaps indigenous business groups um, resented the, what seemed to be the favors that would be given to foreign investors. All this boiled over in January 1974 when the then Japanese Prime Minister, Mr. Tanaka, uh, visited Jakarta and there were the street riots um, reflecting hostility, I think, particularly on the part of student groups to the growing role of the Japanese. Sahato reacted on the one hand by being fairly tough. He clamped down a lot of student groups. He closed newspapers. Uh, but he also realized he'd have to adopt more restrictions on foreign investment. Immediately following, the next year, uh, there was another serious crisis with the, uh, the collapse of Pertamina, the big state oil enterprise. Uh, Pertamina had really been run almost as a state within a state. Um, a flam another rather flamboyant general called Udnu Sotowo uh, really ran it as his own personal fiefdom. Little or no control from either the finance minister ministry or the uh, planning agency. Uh, he ran up colossal debts, foreign debts. Uh, and uh, ultimately this led to a major scandal uh, and the Indonesian government was forced, uh, because it was a state enterprise, it was a government entity, was forced to um, take over the Pertamina debts. Fortunately, 
it had something of a uh, foreign exchange boom at that point with the big jump in world oil prices. Uh, but much of the, in the early years of the so-called oil boom, quite a lot of the extra foreign exchange had to go to pay out these debts. And that was a bitter lesson, not just for Sahata himself, but also for the technocrats advising him. Well, a lot of people thought, I can remember myself, I was working in Jakarta in that period, and many people thought that Sahata was about to go. He was on the skids. You know, he, there'd been major problems, first of all, with the anti-Japanese riots, and then with the Pertamina collapse. Uh, he was almost certainly going to be toppled by riot, rival elements in the military, but he did manage to survive, and I think that was a great credit to his own political and tactical skills. Um, and really from the period, uh, 76, right through until the mid to late 1980s, there were a number of important policy changes. I talk about these in the book. Indonesia is often given credit, not least by the World Bank, for managing the oil boom rather better than other petroleum economies around the world, like Nigeria, say, or Iran. Of course, Iran, there was a violent revolution which toppled the Shah in, in 1978 or indeed places like Venezuela. Um, Sahato and the technocrats did over this period manage to strengthen the control of the central government. And this, I think, in some ways was one of Sahato's most remarkable achievements. He did re-centralize uh, the economy. Uh, and of course, particularly, he reasserted control over those regions producing oil and gas, uh, and also other agricultural exports, the bigger state regions in Sumatra and so on. At the same time, there was a big jump in rice yields, the so-called Green Revolution. Uh, Sahato used the oil revenues to subsidize um, fertilizer, uh, and this led to quite sharp increases in rice um, yields, uh, particularly in Java and Bali, but also some other parts of the country as well. So that led to a big improvement in the food situation. Uh, in fact, by the mid-80s, Indonesia was boasting that it was self-sufficient in rice, no longer having to import rice. And also, through the 1980s, there were a series of policies which did give non-oil export producers greater incentives. And this was when you began to get an increase in labor-intensive manufacturers, textiles, garments, footwear. All this won much admiration from the World Bank and from foreign observers. But there were many critics. By 1995, Indonesia was celebrating 50 years of independence. Quite a lot of triumphant official statements about economic and social improvements. Um, the World Bank, the year before, had put out a report that's called uh, was it the Asian Miracle, something of that sort. Uh, but Indonesia was one of the countries that were included. Uh, indeed, a lot of Indonesians were rather surprised about this. You know, well, are we really? the same as Korea and Taiwan, you know, uh, or even neighboring Malaysia, which they knew was considerably more prosperous in terms of per capita GDP. But nonetheless, Indonesia was patted on the back uh, by the World Bank and indeed by many other, uh, not Western and of course, Japanese um, economists, and government officials and so on. But there was mounting criticism from students, from NGOs, from elements within the business community. Why? Well, I think one of the reasons was the rise of very large business groups, the so-called conglomerates, dominated, many of them, by Chinese who were known to be fairly close to Sahato and his family. Sahato's family had themselves started to build up very large business groups. It was well known this was being done on the back of various lucrative monopolies uh, in the oil sector and elsewhere. There was ongoing problems with regional imbalances. Some of the uh, outer islands were getting increasingly happy. The old problems that were there in the 1950s were starting to re-emerge. Many people thought that in spite of what the government claimed, the poverty problem hadn't really been effectively dealt with. Uh, on top of all this, there were serious uh, environmental problems starting to emerge, particularly as a result of wholesale destruction of Indonesia's forests. Um, there are other grievances as well. Uh, as I said, many people thought the government was lying about poverty reduction. The official poverty figures came under a lot of criticism. People said the poverty line was far too low. 
uh, many uh, young Indonesians and NGOs and so on were really quite outraged that you know the government was using these government officials. Everyone knew perfectly well they were leading fairly lavish lifestyles themselves, but they apparently thought that you know the average Indonesian could live off fifteen dollars a month or something. Uh, and this sort of thing gave rise to more and more criticism. But still, in early 97, and some of you I'm sure can remember this period, Suharto did still appear to be in an impregnable position. Uh, many people thought he was certain to get another five-year time, uh, five-year term as president. He would, in fact, be president for life. I can remember having an argument with the late Michael Leifer down at the LSC. And Michael was taking a view they're never going to get rid of him. He'd be carried out in a coffin. You know. uh, and then, of course, many people thought um, another family member, most likely Tutut, his oldest daughter, would succeed him. Uh, so there was a lot of talk about a Sahato dynasty. This was early 97. Now, by mid-97, serious problems were emerging in Thailand. They weren't exactly... Uh, unanticipated. Everybody knew that the Thai part was overvalued, the Thai economy was slowing down. Uh, finally, of course, the Thai government did in July 97, uh, was really forced uh, to allow the part to float. It floated down with very, very sharply. And there was a lot of discussion, July, August, September 97, would there be contagion to other parts of Asia? As far as Indonesia was concerned, there was a little talk, the fundamentals are strong. You know, this has been a robust, fast-growing economy for the better part of 30 years. Um, but, of course, as we know, what really happened was there was really a massive, unanticipated economic collapse. I give my own views about why this happened in the book. Uh, I must say not everyone agrees with them. Uh, I see much of the problem fundamentally as one of confidence. Uh, I don't agree with the argument the IMF caused the problem, uh, but certainly um, both the IMF and indeed Indo many Indonesian economists were, I think, very slow to grasp how serious the situation was. Certainly, as the magnitude of the crisis became obvious in early 98, I'm sure some of you remember the group here starting to depreciate very, very quickly, the government indeed appeared to be in complete denial in uh, March 98, after Suharto had been re-elected, uh, he announced a new cabinet with no serious technocrats at all. His own daughter was in the cabinet, various other well-known cronies like Bob Hassan, one or two others. Uh, it really didn't have any credibility at all. Um, there were serious riots in May 98, uh, and then, as I said earlier, Suharto resigned in favour of his vice president. Um, Habibi launched a series of reforms. Habibi had a reputation as a bit of an economic crank, and in some ways he was. But rather to everyone's surprise, he listened to some of the competent economists, uh, both in the cabinet uh, and uh, in, in the government, and indeed in the business community as well. Uh, I think the most important of the reforms that he implemented were, uh, was the regional decentralization legislation which was clearly intended to diffuse some of the problems outside Java. And of course, he allowed the referendum in East Timor, uh, which culminated, of course, in 80% of the East Timorese voting for independence. That sent shockwaves through the rest of Indonesia, uh, and indeed in neighboring countries, not least Australia. Um, he failed to be re-elected in 1999. This was when elections to the president were still indirect, in other words, the uh, electorate voted for a new parliament, and the parliament, augmented by various other odds and ends, the so-called MP, uh, elected the president. Uh, so Habibi uh, was not elected. Uh, two further presidents followed quite quickly. Uh, this was a period of considerable instability when many people, certainly abroad, were saying the place is going to break up. I can remember going to a seminar down in the city of London some gentleman announcing in a loud voice that you know Indonesia was the next Yugoslavia, it was going to break up, and the effect on neighboring countries would be devastating, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of that talk was around internationally, and also I think to some extent within Indonesia. But Indonesia held together. I suggest in the book some of the reasons why this 
did happen, why there wasn't a break on. 2004, as a result of constitutional revisions, um, the president was directly elected. And of course, Cecilio Bambangliono, a former Sahato era general, was elected with Yusuf Kala, a well known businessman from eastern Indonesia, from Sulawesi, because he's running. Well, I talk in the book a bit about um, the SBY years. Um, SBY managed to present himself with considerable success as a reforming politician, in spite of his background as a Sahato era general. He had some things going for him. He had very good English. He'd been educated uh, in the United States. Uh, and also international experience. He'd, I think he'd uh, been in charge of the Indonesian uh, peacekeeping contingent in Bosnia. Um, he clearly, certainly compared with Suharto, who of course never really learned English and was never happy speaking a foreign language uh, and never really traveled much outside Indonesia, he presented himself very much as an outward looking cosmopolitan leader of what was going to be a new Indonesia. He made a number of promises about economic reforms. Well, not all these were filled. Uh, 2009, he came up for re-election. Um, perhaps to everyone's surprise, he was re-elected quite comfortably. He didn't actually have to go through a, uh, a second runoff. He got, I think, a majority in, in, the, in the first uh, round of elections. His running mate was no longer Kala, who in fact had teamed up with another candidate. Uh, his running mate was a respected economist called Budiono. Um, and it appears the vast majority, well, not the vast majority, but a substantial majority of Indonesians, I think over 60%, felt that it was safer to stick with this team, uh, particularly as the world economy uh, fell into a severe recession, safer to stick with this team uh, than look for someone else. In well, the last part of the book, I look at the achievements and failings of the Udiono years. They've been fairly well documented and much discussed. Growth accelerated again post-2004, but at the same time, I think the evidence does suggest inequality has increased. In fact, I argue in the book, relative inequalities have probably been increasing in Indonesia for several decades, particularly in urban areas. Indonesia, and here, of course, this is true of many Asian African countries, is urbanizing rapidly, but at the cost of widening inequalities both within urban areas, but also between urban and rural areas. Is economic nationalism still an issue? Well, I argue in the book that yes, I think it is. Um, the Sahato era conglomerates I mentioned earlier, uh, many of them are run by Chinese who are known to be extremely close to Sahato. Uh, and indeed some of them by Sahato's own family. Uh, many of them are still around. Uh, and of course, indigenous business people, again, are complaining that, you know, playing in spite of many statements by Udiono and other ministers, the playing field isn't really level. Um, it's still true that there's a large number of very small businesses in Indonesia, but only a small number of large ones. Uh, and many of them do still seem to be led by Indonesians of Chinese origin, many of whom built up these conglomerates during the Sahara year. I also have a look at the, the question of the role of government. Um, I mentioned earlier during the Sukarno era, the government was really extremely weak. I think one of Sahato's achievements was to strengthen the government. He was helped, of course, by substantial revenues from oil and gas. The problem now, um, the government has to, at least in my view, and I think the view of many observers, it has to mobilize more tax and non-tax revenues. There's still, in spite of the decentralization measures that were originally introduced by Habibi and then implemented in 2001, there are still a lot of tensions between the centers and the region. On top of that, there are still, of course, ongoing debates about corruption. Um, Indonesia is still, according to the World Bank and indeed Transparency International and various other international um, league tables, Indonesia is still seen as a fairly, in some cases, very corrupt country. In 2002, uh, an anti-corruption commission known as the Carpe Car was established. Yudhiyono gave it some support, although I think the support at times was rather grudging. Uh, it does appear uh, that under Jokowi, 
uh, the Cape car has been given more powers, and it is actually now getting some uh, fairly uh, big scalps, as it were. Uh, and in fact, I, I gather, I haven't actually seen it, but I gather the latest Transparency International ranking in Indonesia has moved up a bit, uh, at least partly because in the eyes of many business people, the Carpe car is finally starting to mm. get some muscle, get some. But there is still a serious problem, and of course, this is reflected in what I think is the very low level of confidence that many Indonesians still have in the government. Uh, whether they're business people, or farmers, um, whether they're in Java or elsewhere, I think there is a tendency for many Indonesians to feel, you know, the government is predatory, uh, it's not on our side, as it were. Uh, now, you can say this is hardly unique to Indonesia and in many parts of uh, the world. Uh, governments are profoundly distrusted by large segments of the population. In some ways, we're seeing that now, I think, in, in uh, uh, the uh, rise of people like Trump in America. Um, but uh, I think this is still a serious problem in Indonesia. The central government is not terribly strong in terms of its economic resources, uh, but neither is it really respected, in spite of the fact that you know, the army now seems to be playing very much um, a minor role. Um, and... Uh, Certainly, Jokowi's election, I think, made it clear that it's possible for new politicians to emerge in Indonesia who don't come from the old elites. Uh, but even allowing for all this, um, I think the, the problems, as this is what I argue in the book, the problems are still serious. Uh, I hope very much that Jokowi finishes his term. So far, he seems to be able to deal uh, with problems in the parliament and indeed to some extent problems in the military and civil society. Um, but uh, we can't rule out, of course, and of course the example of Thailand shows that we can't rule out uh, some kind of military coup if indeed the elected uh, civilian government proves to be weak or unstable. Okay, I'll leave it there. I'd be delighted in comments. Thank you very much. So was obviously a very wide-ranging and sweeping outline um, of the book. And obviously, this is a book launch, and uh, there is some leaflets. Uh, is yeah, it? I mean, please. Um, um, where you can, uh, you can get some um, discounts well, <laughs> from the book. I know Joe over in the bookstore's got some copies. So right. I think he'll honor the discounts. Is it down at the LSU? Does anyone know if it's down at the LSU bookstore? Uh, I haven't, I haven't checked yet, no. Yeah. I right. This okay, yeah, so f for the time being, maybe we can open up for uh, questions and. Please, I'd be very interested in comments. So, so uh, uh, anyone wants to start? Yeah. I certainly hope there's no repeat of 1998. Um, as I say, I talk in the book about why I think that economic collapse, remember GDP collapsed by 13% in one year, because that had all sorts of ramifications for living standards and so on. And it took Indonesia seven years to get back to the pre-crisis level of per capita GDP. Some people say, oh, it was just a glitch, a glitch, it wasn't. It was a very serious collapse. And it took a long time for the economy to recover, and I think in some ways we're still seeing some of the consequences. Uh, so I hope nothing like that happens again. I mean, when I'm in the mood to be optimistic, and I'm sure this is true of many Indonesians as well, uh, I argue, well, I think the constitutional amendments that were made in that period between uh, 1999 and 2004, um, they've bedded down. We've now had, what, three direct election, presidential elections. I think the important changes that came about in central regional relations, although they're controversial, I think they have led to a feeling of greater empowerment in the region. There are still serious problems, I think, particularly in what was in 
but in other parts of the other islands as well. And I think many people feel, like some of your probably from uh, the other islands, and I think many people still feel, oh, you know, Java's got the infrastructure, Java's got the, uh, as it were, the best universities, the best schools, and we're relatively neglected. Uh, but at least now, many regions outside Java have more funds to spend on health and education. Now, whether they're going to spend those funds wisely, there's been a fair amount of criticism, there's been a fair amount of criticism of direct election of local officials, and so it's just money, politics, you know, things going mad. Um, and uh, I think many, many who feel that, that to some extent the democracy's got a bit out of hand. Whether they really want to go back to the very centralised system under Suharto, when you know, provincial governors and blue parties were all appointed in the centre. I don't know. Um, but I just hope the reforms, and they, they have been very real reforms. This is where I don't agree with people like some of you may know who work with Freddie Hardy's, Dick Davis, and the so-called Unicorn School. Um, and they're busy arguing, oh, you know, nothing much has changed, the old oligarchs are still running the place, you know, they've, they've just rearranged the benches on the Titanic, but nothing much has happened. I don't agree with that. I mean, I think the post-98 reforms have been significant. Um, but Indonesia is still, it's a middle-income country, facing, as I said, serious problems of inequality, a lot of talk about infrastructure. One of the, I think, bad legacies of the Sahara era was the fact that relatively little was done to expand infrastructure. If you've only got to go to China to see what the Chinese government has done, and I think they've been kind of overexpanded in, you know, the, the high speed trains, the motorways, crisscrossing the whole country. But it is hugely impressive. Uh, and Indonesia still lacks that. So I think everybody knows the congestion in the bigger cities is getting the highway system is still very underdeveloped. When I first went to Indonesia in the 1970s, they were talking about the Trans-Java Highway. They're still talking about <laughs> Trans-Java Highway. I think it will ultimately get built. Hmm. Uh, it's taken an awful long time. For all sorts of reasons, I think we have much the same kinds of problems in India. Um, it's much easier for an autocratic government like China build infrastructure because they just grab the land and give it, if they compensate people and people don't think the compensation is inadequate, it is enough. That's tough, they're involved. Um, but I think for Indonesia and many other democracies in the world, infrastructure development is difficult. I mean, there's a desperate need for better roads in Sumatra, not to mention places like Sulawesi, Kalimantan. There's still a lot of the task we so all this will take time, and then you can't wave a magic wand. And I think the Kohli is very, very near it. Mm. What we'll be able to do, I don't think, is head of things with any view of notes, head of head of criticism, some of it unfair. I think. We certainly bring out a lot of economic packages, and we put the trust on them to see things when something is desperately <laughs> wrong. And they say, says all the right things. Economic integration has, I mean, I know it's rather fashionable to sort of sneer at ASEAN and say, well, it hasn't achieved much, it's just a talking shop, you know. But I think the ASEAN countries as a whole are far more integrated than they were 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think about 25% of total trade within, within ASEAN is interregional trade. Now, okay, that's a low proportion compared with, with Europe, but I'm not sure that the ASEANs would particularly want to follow the European template. You know, it's produced a lot of problems, as we know. Uh, but I think the ASEAN countries now, as a group, I mean, they know a lot more about one another. You know, you've got Indonesians going to study in Singapore or Malaysia, but, or the Philippines. Uh, you've got Filipinos coming to work in, in Indonesia, in, in the banking sector. 
you know, they're, they're mixing far more, and I think learning far more about one another. And I think that will process will continue. So one of the big issues is how will ASEAN respond to China, essentially the threat from China. Well, is it a threat? The Chinese will say, oh no, you know, our aims are peaceful, we want more trade, we want more investment. Uh, but they, the Chinese do tend to want trade and investment on their terms. I think the ASEAN's got to be fairly tough. The Chinese are also rather inclined to play off the weaker states against the stronger ones. Having said all that, you know, I think there are very real benefits to us in terms of trade and indeed other parts of the world. Uh, but uh, it won't be easy for Indonesia. I think it'll be, and of course, there's also the problems of South China Sea, although Indonesia itself is on the margin of involved in those problems, but they could get worse. I mean, I think Indonesia would almost certainly have to back us up. Yep. I have a little bit to say about it. I mean, one could write a whole book on palm oil. Um, in fact, a whole book has just been written on palm oil. I've just been sent a copy of this review. You might have seen it. It's um, just come out from uh, uh, the National University of Singapore Press, uh, and it's edited by uh, two well-known Australian experts Rob Cram and uh, John McCarthy. Um, and it looks extremely interesting, and it's precisely on these issues, the political economy of Palmer. It's very controversial. My own view, I make this point in the book, I think Palmer has been demonized. For some reason, it has become the crop that everyone loves to hate. Uh, in fact, I think most people who take a long, cool look at Palmer in Indonesia think that the benefits from Palmer cultivation have been considerable. And also, there has been and continues to be a serious attempt to build up smallholder industry as well as bigger stuff. But of course, we all know the negatives, the problems of the deforestation, of course, the fires, which are getting huge publicity. Um, now, I don't think they're entirely the result of Palm oil. I think there are other problems, many other problems as well. I mean, it's being argued, as I said, one of the criticisms of Sahata is the way that he just it out wholesale destruction in Indonesia's forest. Um, and uh, I think cleaning up the mess is going to take a long time. I mean, I've heard people argue that um, there was something now like 40 million hectares of badly degraded land, land that was under forest, was deforested. Of course, the forest concessionaires were supposed to replant, but very few of them ever did. Uh, so you really end up with this, um, well, really a problem of desertification. And tackling that's going to be very difficult. I hope, well, I'm sure there will be international help. But the palm oil story, clearly it's complicated, but um, I tend to think some of what comes out from some of the Western environmental <laughs> groups is very exaggerated. I mean, to the point where they say you should, you know, boycott don't buy margarine, <laughs> unless it's got a little sticker on <laughs> it saying this has been sustainably sourced, which I think is nonsense. I mean, I'm told I mean, that sort of palm oil now is in about 20% of everything you buy in the supermarket, from soap and toothpaste, to margarine, a whole range of products. <coughs> and I think world demand for vegetable oils is set to increase very rapidly, not least because of demand in China and India. Um, and Indonesia is one of the few countries, certainly in Asia, that has the capacity to expand palm oil cultivation. The challenge is to make sure it's done in a sustainable way and in a way that benefits local people. But I would recommend this book. Um, as I say, it's just come out. Uh, and uh, it's certainly written by very knowledgeable people who are sensible. I mean, they're not just taking an extreme view. <laughs> I have a question over there. I, I, my question is on economy nationalism. Mm -hmm. 
that. Sorry, are you talking about investment from China? No, or Chinese investment owned Chinese owned conglomerates in India? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. In Cayman Islands, which Very likely, but then practically everybody seems to have. Yeah. Um, there's an excellent book, uh, you, you may know it, it's written by an uh, American journalist with long experience in Indonesia called Richard Borsuk. It's, it's really a biography of Yen Su Long, but it's much more than that. It, it's got this, you know, this famous photo on the front of the Yemen Sahata with their arms around. <laughs> um, and I mean, there's no doubt, the book is quite fascinating. I mean, there's a lot in it I, I hadn't re realized, including the fact that Yem himself, he built up that huge conglomerate everyone knows as a result of favours from Suharto, but he was very shrewd. I mean, he got, you know, Suharto's, uh, Subu Katmono, I think he was a cousin of Suharto's, was one of the key um, original investors uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in Liam's conglomerate. Uh, and uh, in addition, of course, um, there were, he's always had a lot of indigenous business people working for him. Uh, and I think you're right that I mean, partly as a result of, of the sort of, you know, the criticism uh, during the latter part of the Sahato era about the conglomerates. I mean, every time you picked up a business magazine, you know, there'd be yet another list of the top 20 or the top 30 or the top 50, and look, they're practically all owned by either Chinese or Sahato's family or the family of a few other very well-connected you know, political families. Uh, now, understand that, you know, I think that sort of thing would cause problems in practically any country, really. Uh, but I do think there have been changes. As, as I said, many of the conglomerates now, okay, you know, maybe they're still, quote, owned by well-known families of, of Chinese descent, although as you quite rightly say, by now the third or fourth generation Indonesians. Uh, but of course, they're recruiting more and more Indonesian managers, and indeed, you know, you look now at the figures. Uh, one of the interesting developments post Sahata was that they've started to ask ethnic questions again in the census. In 2010, they, they just, people were, quote, invited uh, to identify themselves by ethnicity. Now, of course, during the Sahata era, that was not allowed at all. Uh, and it seems that there are about, in 2010, there are about 2.8 million Indonesians out of, what, 240 million identified themselves as Chinese. Now, many are probably partially Chinese, and, you know, or perhaps just didn't want to say they were Chinese. But it's a very small number. And, you know, you look at many big firms now, and you know, look at professions, you look at the legal profession or the medical profession. Now, in the early 1950s, these professions were dominated by China, Indonesians of Chinese descent. Now, of course, the great majority are indigenous. Well, I know Indonesians make jokes about the number of batas who are lawyers and so on. But, so I suppose that's a different kind of ethnic <laughs> problem. But um, I think it is changing. It's changing very rapidly, simply because more indigenous Indonesians are getting better education and moving into professional and managerial jobs. I know people like Adam Schwartz, an American who's had, again, long experience in Indonesia. I think I've heard him argue, two generations, the problem will have gone. You know, nobody will bother him. You know, you might have had a Chinese great-great-grandfather, but who cares? You know, you're Indonesian, you look Indonesian, you speak Indonesian. So I think it's a problem that will inevitably go away. I think the problem is actually much less serious in Malaysia, partly because the numbers are much smaller, but also because Malay politicians just can't help playing the race card in Malaysia. And I don't think that is now the case in Indonesia. So in some ways, I think I would worry more about the problem in Malaysia than in Indonesia. Um, I think, you know, I mean, you can understand why, you know, the Malaysian government decided to set up the new economic policy. But my own view is they should have scrapped it years ago. Of course, you've now got massive vested interests within UMNO. Um, 
that just do not want this affirmative action to go. And I think that's a very serious problem. I think it's causing a lot of the current ructions with Najib. But just changing Najib and getting another Prime Minister isn't going to solve the problem in Malaysia, I don't think. We're really going to need quite massive political change. Uh, so in some ways, I worry more about Malaysia than, than Indonesia. Any further questions? Yes, please. Uh, this is the Islam will be a problem for the stability uh, in the Middle East. Hmm. Well, one of the things, I mean, I don't know if you were there or not, but a few years ago, Rudy and I came to London, we actually gave a talk about the Middle East. No. Were you there? No. Probably not. But um, anyway, it was a bigger lecture there than this, and it's absolutely and I must say, Yuri Yana was awful. This was where he was awfully good at talking to an international audience in good English um, and projecting Indonesia as this, you know, enlightened Islamic democracy um, and, you know, all the dreadful things we hear about the Middle East. Uh, of course, this doesn't apply to Indonesia and, by extension, Malaysia as well. Um, and I noticed Hillary Clinton at one stage after one of the lightning visits to Indonesia was going on about this as well. You know, she thought that if, if you want an example of a country that, which is democratic, mm. majority Muslim, women play an important role in the economy, blah, 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 you just go to Indonesia. You know, and of course, Obama obviously <laughs> family background is the same as mother and teacher. He spent a couple of million years with the Ford Foundation, which is an he pushes this in as well. Uh, I think broadly it's true. I think the number of extremists are tiny. Now, you know, even if it's only a few hundred, if you sympathize with us, it's like the, the traffic shooting in Jakarta a couple of months ago. You know, of course they can cause trouble. But I really think the numbers are so small um, that it, it ought not to be a major problem. And I've heard The Indonesian police, with a lot of assistance, I think, particularly from the Australian Federal Police, they have greatly improved their uh, security methods. I think they've got a very clear idea. I mean, even the Jakarta attacks a couple months ago, but they pretty quickly moved into the problem. It's never, it's always going to be, I mean, given the international problems of the country like this, where you from Malaysia, we're never going to be free of contamination. Any other questions? Can I take the privilege as the chair and ask one question? Um, can I ask a little bit more of your evaluation of Jokowi? And particularly, how much do you see his rise as a response to the kind of regional inequality, conflict, and kind of crisis of confidence over governance? Um, you know, to what extent his rise is a response to this? And if so, you, you started with the three turning points, but when we reflect back a couple of decades later, would we see 2014 as another turning point? No, I don't think so. I, don't think it's, uh, I think I see it as 
continuation of the uh, you know the democratic process. Mm. We, we all know, uh, of course, one of the uh, constitutional amendments put a limit on the term of president. Sure. Two terms, ten years. We almost ten years were up, stepped down. I don't quite know what he's doing for himself now, but probably playing the role of international elder statesman or something. But um, uh, and as far as I know, he 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 certainly didn't get directly involved. Yeah. It ended up as a two-way race, as you know, between the mm. and I know there's you know, various views on yeah. you know, some people tell me he's a return to character, I have no doubts. But, uh, anyway, Jacoby, as I say, he didn't come out of the sort of elite political yeah. class. Mm. He actually, in that way, is a very interesting guy because he comes out of the social class, and of course, many people claim never really existed and still doesn't exist, and that's the indigenous Javanese. Bourgeoisie, you know, his father, his parents ran a furniture, his family ran a furniture factory, I gather quite successfully. So he understands the problems of small and medium scale businesses far more, I think, than the Vienna or the Vienna. I think the real problem is whether he will have the support to allow him to work in the future and to be the person truly wanted. And the parliament is a One, I think we were perhaps rather naive in 1980 to expect somebody just to know and wave the magic wand and all the bad elements of the Sahara medicine. Sure. No, it's never that easy. Yeah. In any case, and again, I mean, I know you know, it's not that I don't think it's that easy. Uh, again, I mean, I know uh, it's, uh, it's become quite voguish to compare Indonesia with Egypt, I'm told. Political scientists are all running around doing this. And obviously, if one does compare in some ways managed to negotiate the problem far more successfully than we did, sure. which is just about being on a military man. I mean, I don't know much about him. Um, he may not be as you know, corrupt or distasteful as Mubarak was. Mm. Uh, but Indonesia, uh, you know, Egypt was far from being a democracy. Sure. Uh, so in that sense, I, I mentioned Teddy Hadis earlier, some of you will probably know him. I actually think he's a very perceptive observer of Indonesia, Indonesia, but he's now got a project looking at, I think, he's comparing Indonesia with Turkey and Egypt. So that, I think, mm. will come up with some rather interesting <laughs> conclusions. And some people claim that, you know, the current leadership in Turkey yeah. point of himself on Sahara. Leaders who model themselves on Sahara usually end up badly. <laughs> Still, I mean, I think, no, I think, as I say, I don't see 2014 as, a, as in any sense a turning point. I think mm. it's, a, it's a continuation of a democratic process that's been surprisingly successful. Right. One can only hope it will be. I mean, there are probably elements in the military who are still fed up. Um, I don't know how much backing Prabowo really had in the military. Mm. You hear different views from different people. Um, but I think the whole, the rise of Jokowi is, in, and it's not just Jokowi, I mean, getting all these politicians cropping up. There's this woman in East Java, I think she's the mayor of Surabaya. Is that right? What's her name? Yeah. She seems again to be an extraordinarily interesting, forceful person. I don't agree with all her views. I mean, she seems to have very strict views on the sale of alcohol. Um, it's understandable, perhaps. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the de decentralization process, the local regional elections, you know, they are going to produce a new class of politicians from the regions. And I think, on the whole, that can only be healthy for Indonesia. Um, but then, of course, people look at the Philippines and say, well, look at the horrors that emerge from the provinces in the Philippines, including this guy that looks like he may not be elected as the next president. <laughs>
he apparently believes, among other things, in extrajudicial killings. And it's all a bit shocking. But so far, I think Indonesia's, it's matured politically in a way that I would not have predicted 15 years ago. And I think it looks, in some ways, does look better than this mm -hmm. um, Where you've got these problems of you know, local mafia bosses and then John Seville down at the LSC writes about this. You know. Uh, and the Philippines doesn't seem to be able to break out of that. So one hopes Indonesia will be able to. But time will tell. Mm -hmm. But I think so far Indonesians can be quite proud of what's been achieved since 19. And as I say, I mean, things could have been a lot, lot worse. A lot worse. Mm. Well, I think on infrastructure, I mean, there are a number of challenges that Indonesia needs. You hear people saying Indonesia needs six new container ports. It certainly needs several. I mean, the, the, mayor, the port at Tanjung Priok in Anjikata is hopelessly over congested. And of course, the roads, because, you know, those huge trucks. I mean, the last time I got stuck in a traffic jam coming in from Shankara, and this happens well, on a daily basis. You've got these huge trucks coming in from you know, all the factories out at Tango. They're coming in to try and get food for Tanjung Priok. Uh, you've got the taxis and buses coming in from the airport. Then you've got just local people you know, trying to get from point A to point B. And all using one not particularly wide road. And there are you know, points where the road narrows and the, the jams and just get brittle. Now, what's the solution? Well, one solution is, is a fast train in from Chengkara. Now, I, didn't know why, I don't know why they didn't do that 25 years ago. And if you go to Beijing Airport or Shanghai Airport, there are fast trains into the city. They're not cheap. Uh, but you can get into the city without having to negotiate congested roads. Um, now, I would have thought that was a perfectly profitable, as it were, business to hand over to a private train operator. Uh, but here I think one comes back to this sort of nationalism. I mean, the parliament gets very upset whenever there's any suggestion foreigners are brought in, even for electricity generation, which is another area where Indonesia has much more capacity. Um, and, and of course, we've also now got the Constitutional Court playing what many economists see as a very negative role. Now, the constitutional support likes to say, ah, look at that, we need to find this Article 33 and an open and signed constitution. Is it the, um, uh, Indonesia's resources must be used for the good of the people. Well, I mean, nobody's going to argue with that. Does that really mean that you can't, say, have a French firm uh, building a power plant in Sumatra or, or East Java? I think that, I think the nationalism is still a serious problem. Now, I don't know really where the, the problems are in the parliament, in the courts, some combination of both. But there still is this reaction whenever uh, foreign participation in infrastructure is mentioned. Now, okay, you get it in India as well. You get it in many parts of Africa. So I'm not saying Indonesia is necessarily worse than other parts. I think with China, partly because we had a very autocratic country, we can push these projects through, and if the local people get well tough, we just shut up or we shoot you. But certainly post Sahata, no Indonesian government's been able to do that, even if it claims they might have wished. There's a very good book by uh, American political scientist called Jamie Davison, actually, about road building and some of the problems. 
particularly the Thames Drama Highway. I think he spells out, you know, the sort of political and economic problems very well. They're not going to go away anytime soon, and this is where I think the Parliament has played a rather disappointing you know, in the way it kind of structures the role. Finally, I think there is what new train lines in Japan have begun, and that means I think the Chinese um, fed up. And of course, that was controversial, and then the Japanese got upset. Well, Japanese are losing out, and then they've lost out in Australia and they've got somewhere in the country. So they're feeling a bit mixed up in that generally. Um, but I, my own view is individual has to have foreign participation in this way, partly just for the technical partly also for the money. I mean, I was a bit amused because I was in Jakarta just before the 2014 election. And of course, both Jokowi and Prabowo were running around the country with these shopping lists. And Prabowo would come up with his list of infrastructure you know, projects and X billion dollars. And the next day, Jokowi would come up with an even longer one and so on. Which up to a point was OK, because at least now I think they realize the importance the infrastructure. But of course, what they weren't saying is, A, where is the money going to come from? And B, how are these projects actually going to be? Well, remember, Jarlamal is one of the most densely populated areas on the planet. I mean, the 2010 census gave the population that was 137 million people, mm -hmm. and it was like that. Uh, which means about 1,000 people per square kilometer. Well, the Netherlands, which is considered the most densely settled part of Europe, is 500 people in this world. So, you know, Java is very densely settled. Uh, a lot of Java is becoming urban or suburban. You know, fixed around, say, the city of Bandung, which I knew in the 1970s, and there were some offices. It's all housing. And that, I think, is also the case across much of Central and East Java, and that will probably continue. But it does mean that building roads, and, you know, because you've got to fight with dozens of people even to get a road to a car park, let alone, you know, highway to a I mean, Jokowi, when he was mayor of Jakarta, he sort of went around the compounds and negotiated with people, and, you know, gave them a good bar, just good bars, so this is the same place just to get the land. But he can't do that for the whole country. Um, and I think the role of local government, governors, blue parties, will be very important. But you know, if they're pushing their own agenda, their own interests, it's going to be very difficult. And somebody estimated recently to get a, you know, a, a new highway through Sumatra from Lumpur right up to Mayda, right up to Aachen. We're going to be negotiating something like 500 different, no, no, perhaps not 500 methods, I think 200 um, local government units, which is a massive thing for any government. Um, so it's, it's, it is going to be difficult. Well, you know, I think there's a desperate need for better roads in Sumatra. Of course, the Sumatra is looked across to Malaysia. Trans Malaysia Road that Mahathir built, going from uh, uh, you know, crossing from Singapore and Lahore right up to the border with Thailand. Mm. It's you know, very impressive multi lane highway. So, why can't we have something like that? And ultimately, they'll get it, but it will take time. Mm. Um, it will be difficult. And you know, I think the one of the perhaps unintended consequences of the decentralization legislation is that you are building up a lot of you know, local fiefdoms, if you like. I'm not saying every blue party is a crook. I don't think that's true. <laughs> well, perhaps. No, I think many have a genuine desire to improve the you know, health, education, roads, bridges, and all that. But they don't necessarily have the funding themselves. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the engineers. They don't have the teachers and health workers. And so, on. so it will take time for all the, you know, for these to be trained. You know, there's plenty of talent in there. It's a question of making good use through their education, through their 
things arose with a lot of the spoken word in Foucault, and particularly the most pisicist as well as more experienced. He said the visualists, the, the lowest of the possible spoken word, I think, would be the second visual. And this was after Juliano you know, improved the salaries of teachers, brought in new uh, professional qualifications to teachers. And he was in Benita still coming second. And people pointed out quite correctly, well, it'll take time for these reforms to bed down. And many people, and certainly at the primary level, even at the secondary level, many teachers are bad They were appointed in the 70s and 80s, and I think they were the most high school teachers. Yeah. So they weren't particularly important. Now they're old and probably about to retire. Um, so, you know, if the quality of Looking recently at like some of the you know, those ty Times Higher Rankings of the universities, and last year they did one for Asian universities. And there wasn't a single Indonesian university in the top ten. You know, you had all the well known Chinese and Hadini institutes at the top ten. Mm. And the university had taken one or two out of Japanese institutions. Uh, there were a couple of tiny institutions. There's Mahidol. No, not Chula. I don't think Chula was in it. Um, no, it was one of the engineering courses. Possibly, I think, I think, yeah. But there were two places from Korea. Mahidol uh, was certainly not in But not a single one of them. Now, it may be that it's all a bit biased. I mean, I'm not, you know, I think people say the Times Higher Ranking favours the English speaking institutions, which may be. So it is a worry. I think the standard of education is still hugely low. And in a way, they, they, you know, this is, I think, a legacy from the Dutch period that Indonesia still hasn't really managed to overcome. I mean, there's a big expansion in the 50s, but they're doing often poor quality teachers. Um, the quality of education was not terribly good through the 50s and into the 60s, but those, those were the people who became the teachers of the next generation. And it's difficult to break out of that cycle. Um, and I think you know, the other thing that did the right thing was in stressing better training and better salaries. But again, I think it would take time for you to do to think about it. But I'm moderate <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, um, I think uh, it's getting quite late. So, yeah, it's been, it was a fascinating session. So, uh, thank you very much for staying until late. And can well, we also thank, thank uh, Anne for. Uh, and as I say, there's still some flyers. Yes, please do take the flyer and please do buy the book, which is, of course, the whole point uh, of the session. Particularly on palm oil. Do get hold of this. It looks, I haven't had time to look at it carefully, but I think it's pretty good. And I think the palm oil issue is a hugely important one, actually, because it, I think it says a lot about, A, what Indonesia's managed to achieve. Remember, palm oil is not indigenous to Southeast Asia. It comes from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Now, why aren't the Nigerians growing palm oil? Why is all the palm oil now being grown in Malaysia and Indonesia? That in itself is a very interesting question. That's true. And I think the, you know, I'm not a person who demonizes palm oil. And I think many millions of Indonesians have benefited. But I think the challenge is to make sure that particularly the smallholders benefit a bit more. And hopefully, I think, again, it's a process of reform, better policies. <laughs>
but they think it can be done. I mean, look at the robber story, which I think is a great triumph for Southeast Asia. I mean, robber again, not a crop indigenous to Southeast Asia, but now it's almost all grown in Southeast Asia, natural robber, and almost all grown by smallholders. There's very few large robber estates left. Hopefully it will. I mean, you know, for technical reasons, it's more difficult for smallholders to grow palm oil. They've got to get it to the factory for processing more quickly. Now, I often think rubber is the ideal family-friendly crop. Anyone can tap a rubber tree. You know, the women do it, the kids do it, anyone does. But palm oil is more difficult physically, and you need more capital equipment for the processing. But I think if they work away at it, I think things will improve. So I'm certainly not a person who, who's against palm oil. <laughs> um, but I think that, uh, you know, there have been problems. Nobody can manage them. Okay, so let me thank again, uh, Anne, for your excellent presentation. And thank you, everybody, for your participation as well. Well, there's still some of these, if anyone wants one. Otherwise, I will... I'll take some... Mm -hmm. Maybe.